Good work for me. <laughs> we, we, we will continue with Jennifer Tilly, who is one of the stars, along with Jim Carrey and Liar Liar. Uh, the toll-free is up and running at 800-952-2788. You're watching and listening to CBS. back with the effervescent Jennifer Tilly, and here is Frank on the toll-free in Philadelphia. Hi, Frank, and welcome to CBS Late Night. Hi, Tom. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? It was 97 degrees here in L.A. today, and we're all steamed, Frank. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, that wishes for better luck ahead uh, thank with you, the sir. weather. Uh, hi, Jennifer. Hi, Frank. Uh, it's nice to talk to you. I've, I've been a fan, and I admired your movies for years. In fact, I uh, saw a sneak preview of Liar Liar last night. Oh, you were, oh, really? I was yes. at the premiere of Liar Liar last night. But really? you weren't at the premiere, you were at a sneak preview? Yes. Yeah, was preview. it funny? Did you enjoy it? I loved it. You were terrific. Thank you. Did you laugh hysterically? I laughed hysterically. Jim Carrey was wonderful, and mm -hmm. I recommend everybody see it. Thank you. Did you think Jim Carrey stole that movie away from me? Because <laughs> that's what my dad said when the movie was over. And the lights came up, she leaned over and said, Jim Carrey stole that movie away from you. <laughs> I'm like, Dad, it's not the Jennifer Tilly show. Jennifer, you held your own. Thank you. Let me say. Thank you. Did um, you notice the little bald spots on the back of my head towards the end of the movie? Would you give Frank a chance to oh. ask his question, <laughs> for heaven's sake? Oh, all right. <laughs> I'm just so happy there's somebody that wants to talk to me. Do you, do you, well, do you, who's not getting paid? Do you, do, you, do you itch all over? Am I stretching well, myself? I know, you're just... I just like to touch myself. It's been a long time since I broke up with my boyfriend. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Mm. Yes, Frank? Don't well, Jennifer, yes. We, Jennifer, we could talk later. Oh, no, that's quite all right. Okay. Um, Jennifer, I, I know that obviously you, you come from a very famous family, and I wanted to know if it was ever difficult uh, being compared with your sister Meg. Oh, you know what? Before the show started, Carol, my publicist, made a special call to the Tom Snyder people, and she said, under no circumstances are you to bring up Jennifer and Jennifer's sister Meg and the rivalry between them. And so look at this. Somebody calls from Philadelphia. You notice I haven't. People want to know. The public I, I, wants to know. I haven't brought it up. And Did I'm, you get I, that special note? Don't talk about Jennifer's sister, Meg. She has her own career. No, no, I didn't. Oh, you didn't get that note. I didn't get well, the note. Well, you won't do it anyway because you're tactful. I'm like Frank from Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get that. I didn't Frank get has that the memo. benefit of 2,500 miles. Oh, yeah. there you go. You didn't get what? I didn't get that memo. I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right. You know what? It was hard when I was starting out because when I came out to Hollywood. I came out first, and my sister was in New York, and she was trying to be a ballet dancer. And I majored in theater, and I came out to Hollywood, and I was struggling and selling sandwiches on the street. And then my sister heard her back, and she came out to Hollywood to stay with me, and she decided to be an actress. And at the time, I felt really sorry for her, but I thought, I thought you don't just decide to become an actress. You know, I've been training for years. And it, it makes sense. She got like an agent within a month. Within three months, she was starring on a movie. And like within a year, she had an Oscar nomination. So in Meg's case, you did. She did uh, just decide to become an actress and became very successful. So of course, like four years later, as I sort of began to get in the public eye, people just assumed I followed on her coattails. But it was the other way around. So it was a little hard in the beginning, but it's not so much anymore. And um, it hasn't been too much of an issue because we do different types of parts. I mean, Meg tends to play more tragic, ethereal characters, and I tend to play bald characters. <laughs> <laughs> Balding blondes. So, does that answer your question to your satisfaction, Frank? More than to my satisfaction. And as I said, you were wonderful in your most recent role, and I, and I really enjoy your work. And keep Thank up the you. good work. Thank you. I will. Thanks for calling, Frank. Thanks, Tom. All right. Goodbye now. Take care. And thank you for answering the question. I, yes. You know, I would never embarrass you or ask you anything here that, that, that would make you uncomfortable. That's okay. Hardly anything makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> now, now, you mentioned... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, you you mm -hmm. mentioned that you and your boyfriend broke up. Yes, we did. Was there a, a reason for that? Um, there was a rift. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there was. Yes. You know, I was trying H having, to have... Having been through this on occasion, I know that there is a rift. Right, yes. right, right. There was, you know, I was trying to ha maintain a relationship for a while before I realized he was gone. You know, so... <coughs> I'm coughing now. 
Hmm. I was at the Liar Liar premiere last night with this really bad cold, so I think everyone's going to come down with it. <laughs> I was coughing into, like, all the interviewers' microphones. And, and, and what would have what? produced the rift as I press on? Oh, okay. Uh, well, and you if, know you, don't, and if no, you don't want no, to, you know, I, don't... I think it's really difficult when you're um, dating me because um, it's hard because I'm in the public eye, yeah. and I have, like, people always wanting to take my picture sure. and follow me around. And um, I'm sort of self-involved. <laughs> <laughs> Never would have guessed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's all about me, 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 me. But, you know, I don't but know. enough about you. What do I think yes. of you? <laughs> right, right. But um, yeah, I, I think it, I think it's difficult when you're dating somebody that's in show business, which right. is why I would never do it personally. But it's hard now because now I'm doing that thing where I'm dating. And I've never really been a dater before. I've had a couple long-term relationships, mm -hmm. all which ended disastrously. And um, now I'm sort of in my 30s, my very low 30s, if, in case you were wondering. And um, I'm, I'm looking around for somebody, but what I notice is everybody is either married well, or in Well, at your point in time now, young 30s, people have a relationship or they're married and they have yes, kids. That's true. And I used to be very picky. I mean, a while ago I was saying, I mean, when I first got broken up I, with my boyfriend, I was saying I'm not going to date anybody under the age of 30. I mean, I had these very definite things. They had to have, you know, this, all these qualities right. that you would. Now I'm like, this weekend I'm going out with a 26-year-old. I think next weekend I'm going out with a 44-year-old. It's like anything goes. <laughs> Any kind of package. I'm not like into physical perfection. I'm not into, you know, extreme intelligence. I'm right. not into youth. I'm not into age. I'm just looking for somebody that will hurt me very much emotionally. Because <laughs> that's what turns me on. Oh, come on. <laughs> yes, no, it's true. That's what I'm searching for. Oh, come on. <laughs> I like bitter, cynical men. I like them. I like men where they say, I've been hurt really bad, and then that's like an excuse for them to hurt you back. I like that because I feel like I can change them. And then I'll waste, like, you know, several years of my life. And when I realize I can't Why? change them... What, 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 what is it about men that women want to change? Because I, I've noticed in mm. my relationships through mm. my life that yeah. there's always an effort on the part of women to change a guy. Right. Why, why is that? I think women are very <clears throat> maternal, and they want to mold people. Okay. And, and I think the thing is, men... You know, I've never met a man that's really um, perfect. No, no, we are a work in progress. There's yeah, it's no a work in progress. So it makes you feel like you have something to do. It's like if you have a real good Rubik's Cube, you know, the yeah. thing that they had in the 70s. Yeah. You would know what that was, Yes, right? I would, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you have it and you turn it all around so everything matches, then it's not fun anymore. No. I mean, you don't sit and put it on your desk and just study it for hours and think, I'm really clever. No, you move on to something else. Yeah. So that's, I have lots of platonic friends that, and male friends that have been friends of mine for years. And whenever I meet them, a lot of them have broken up with their girlfriends now. They're always complaining. Why don't girls like nice men? Because these are really nice men. Mm -hmm. We've had relationships for a really long time. Yeah. And I can't, I can't answer that. But I look across the table at them and I think, I would never go out with you because they're too nice. Um, uh, see, I, I, had a, I had an appointment with my psychiatrist this morning, but I totally forgot. and She charged me $300 anyway. So it's like, now I'm taking it out on you. This is all stuff I had to discuss with Dr. Mercer this morning. But, you know, she called me up on the phone. I, I, I think it's like psychological because the last four appointments I've had, I conveniently forgot. And she always like, and I'm always at home puttering around the kitchen, you know, reading the comics and uh -huh, stuff. Uh -huh. And the phone rings and I don't answer. I think I'm sure there's nobody I want to talk to. This is my life. And then I go to answer it about half an hour later and my psychiatrist appointment is like 45 minutes done. So you either talk the last 15 minutes, I'll pretend I'm on my way out the house and I don't have to talk to her at all. Let, let, let me do a fast mm -hmm. break. I just can't imagine you ever having to go to a psychiatrist. Well, you know, a lot of my friends don't like to listen to me talk ad nauseum. <laughs> it's like, it's kind of like I get it out with somebody that's getting paid to listen gotcha, to me. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. I, I, like I find you, it, I, 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 you're, you're not paying me, but I find it fascinating. I'm not paying listen. you, but you're getting paid, aren't you? Yes, I am. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I listen to you for nothing. Oh, would you? Jennifer Tilly uh, is one of the stars of Liar Liar, along with Jim Carrey and an all-star cast. Uh, the toll-free is up and running, and we'll continue after this short break. Yes, I will. With Moon Picture star Jennifer Tilly, who appears with Jim Carrey and Liar Liar, it opens nationwide on Friday. Here is Joseph on the toll-free in Boston. Hi, Joseph. Welcome to CBS Late Night. Hi, how you doing? Okay, Joseph, go ahead, please. Uh, first of all, let me tell her that blonde or brunette, I think she's beautiful. Thank you, Joseph. You're welcome. Now, this and is a phone call I like. <laughs> and then he's going to say, but 
But I've been hurt quite a bit in the past. No, just joking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But my question has to do with the remake of The Getaway. Right. And I w I'm just curious if that was your first nude scene, and if so, if it was an uncomfortable experience for you. Um, you know what? It was my second nude scene, but it was very uncomfortable for me because it was my very first day of work. Is I think I was talking about this the last, the last time, time I was on the show because I obsessed about this. <laughs> but um, they told me if I auditioned for the movie that they were saying the actresses couldn't even audition unless they were willing to do the nude scene. Because a lot of times what you do is you get the part and then you say, but I don't want to do any nudity. And they were saying up front that you have to do the nude scene. They How nice think of it was them. very, very important. How nice Yeah, of but them. it was like my first day on the set and I just barely met Michael Madsen and they, they said, well, now go into the other room and take off all your clothes and feign mad passionate sex. And um, it was fun because Michael made it fun because, you know, he was making all these jokes and everything and nobody else was allowed in the room. And like what kind of jokes? Well, you, I forget what. They, they seemed very funny at the time. I was just laughing hysterically. And then um, when my ex-husband was well, in, in the movie. It's gotta be Sam. No, not my, not my real ex-husband. Oh. My husband in the movie. Well, I'm married to veterinarian and Michael Madsen is Rudy and he kidnaps us. So a few people who haven't seen it, Tom. <laughs> he's, he's smiling cynically. <laughs> he's like, nobody saw that movie. <laughs> He's in a dream world. No, no. The but Getaway so anyway, was a very popular movie. Okay, so, very popular. Okay, so the story is, you probably saw the original. You yes, probably I did. Saw, okay. And I saw yours, too. Oh, you saw mine? Yes, did I you, did. You saw me naked? Yes, I did. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. So, um, anyway. <laughs> so, anyhow, the husband of my character is tied up and he hears me screaming. And so right. he bangs his, he hops his chair to the door to so the he can door, look through right. the door to see what's going on so he can protect me. And we're making love. And the problem was, is Michael and I were laughing so hard when my husband, the actress playing my husband, started screaming when he saw us. It struck us as really funny and we couldn't stop laughing. And then we were really embarrassed because we thought we ruined the take and Roger Donaldson said, no, I like that. It's so mean. Keep it in. When you, when, when they say go in the other room and take off your clothes. We had to take everything off. Does it hit you that all of a sudden, man, I'm walking out in front of perfect strangers? Well, we didn't have to walk. We got under the covers. Oh, we okay. removed everything. And I didn't feel really naked. There was, um, when I was actually doing it, I mean, I was wishing I was on the bottom, but Michael was the star, and he said he had to be on the bottom. So I was like, sort of, <laughs> I was sort of dripping over him. But the camera, it seemed like we were alone, and um, he kept, he kept, like, we were kept pulling. I'll keep that in mind. If you're the star, you get to be wherever you want. Right? Yes, that's right. That's right. And there's like a sheet, and I kept trying to pull it up over my butt. Uh -huh. And there was one guy, and his only job was to run into the room and pull the sheet back down so my butt showed. That was his job. So, anyhow. What, and leave showbiz, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, Michael was doing, he was, like, trying to cover up, you know, the naked bits with his hands. But when I saw the movie, obviously, he didn't succeed. And also, too, I saw it the first time with my publicist, and they did a Real long shot they did my husband's point of view through the door so you could see us way in the background but i guess the people on the cards that they fill out you know the audience survey mm -hmm, cards mm -hmm. that we want to see more of jennifer's butt so when i saw it in the premiere with all my family and friends it was so embarrassing because the image leapt and all of a sudden instead of being way way across the room it's like we were two feet away from the audience and it was a little more nude than i would have liked mm -hmm. but <clears throat> but that's okay i don't mind did you like seeing your Naked posterior riding up and down on Michael Madsen's groin. Well, <laughs> not as much yeah. as the rest of the country. <laughs> I don't think I have too many more nude scenes than me. <laughs> Joseph, I'm glad you called, and I, I think Jennifer has answered your question admirably. Thank you, yes, Joseph. Thanks for calling, sir. Goodbye. Thanks for having me. Bye, Jennifer. All right, bye-bye now. I'm told you read the tabloids now and again. Uh, yes, I love the tabloids. And my mom used to say to me, only trashy girls read the tabloids. To her, even if you're, she said, okay, if you're in a really long checkout stand and they're right there and, you know, it's taking a long time, you can flip through them, but you have to act really disinterested and you have to make a face like, can you believe this stuff? And you have to say <laughs> stuff like, oh, who buys this and put it back on the stand? But if, <laughs> if you actually buy it, you have crossed over the line. Then you are not a good girl. You are trailer park trash. So in the beginning, I used to be so embarrassed. I would go in and buy so many groceries to go with my tabloids. Like, it accidentally fell into the car. But now I have no shame. I walk down to the newsstand. I'm like, I'll take this and this and this. But, but now they, they printed your picture with Michael Wincott well, and implied that you thing. two are an item and say that's I, not true? I always believed everything I read in the tabloids. And one day I had, you know, the Star of the Inquirer and the Globe. Mm -hmm. And I was flipping through them. And first of all, I was reading the Globe. And it said, you two thumbs. And I was like, hmm, I wonder who. And this is a picture of me with me. an actor that I didn't, what? 
you and Michael Wincott. Said I barely met. I was at House of Blues thing, and he came up to me, introduced himself, and somebody all of a sudden went, hey, can we get a picture of the two of you together? And we're like, oh, okay, like that. And then all of a sudden, we're in the Globe as a new twosome. And then I was reading the Acquirer, and it said, sorry to have had plastic surgery. I'm like, ooh, I wonder if I have plastic surgery. And it was me. <laughs> I was <laughs> under a list of celebrities that had breast implants. Really? I was appalled. I couldn't wait to call my friend Paul and say, because obviously I have not. I have amazingly perfect breasts, but they're, you know, all natural. As you can see, when you, if anybody who's seen me in my unfettered glory can see that. Mm -hmm. You know, anybody who rents the getaway. I'm, I'm just trying to look you right in the eye. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's like, it's not something I, you know. But anyway, so I was quite shocked. I thought, because I it never occurred to me they made up this stuff. So anyhow, I called my friend Paul, and after we commiserated about how could they say this about me, about the implants and Michael Wincott, I said, can you believe Leonardo DiCaprio? spent the night over at Jimmy Moore's house? And Paul goes, what are you talking about? I said, well, it was in the Inquirer. It said that he spent the night over. But he this said, is the same paper, that I know, and that's what he said. He said, look, you just read that you have breast implants and you're dating Michael Wincott, and you believe that Leonardo DiCaprio and Jimmy Moore spent the night together. I said, well, they have pictures of... He, he was leaving her house and he was wearing the same clothes. And Paul said, yeah, because he probably left her house about an hour later. Yeah. I said, but it said underneath it was 11 a.m. the next morning. He said, they could just print it any time underneath the picture. So then I started to realize you should not believe everything you read. What you, you should do is have somebody do your shopping for you. Yeah. Then you won't be tempted anymore. Well, no, I, that's my, I love the tablets. I just love them. I love them, but I'm not going to bring them into civilized conversation anymore. I love to drop nuggets that I read in Newsweek or Time or, you know, the New Yorker in the conversation. But I shouldn't be saying, can you believe Leonardo DiCaprio and Demi Moore? Bruce is going to be so mad. You know, that's like tacky. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I know yeah. that, that Liar Liar will be a huge hit. Do you read the tablets? You do, don't you? No, I don't. I know you do. Not a word. Look, I could tell. Swear to God. Do it close upon him. Look, he's lying. Swear to God. Look, he's lying. Look. Swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> You're lying. Okay. Jennifer Tilly, look for her and, uh, and Jim Carrey. Yes. And Liar Liar, which opens this coming Friday the 21st at theaters and a few drive-ins everywhere. Uh, theaters within a 10-minute walk of your house. Thanks for coming over, Jennifer. Thank it's you. always a joy to be with you. Thank you. My pleasure. Next, John Gregory Dunn and Monster after these messages. <laughs> In his latest book, John Gregory Dunn has focused his reporter's eye on the movie industry, a business in which he often works. The book is about the eight-year ordeal he and his wife, co-screenwriter Joan Didion, went through in getting last year's motion picture up close and personal onto the screen. It is a sobering and often funny look at the business of showbiz. It is called Monster, and we'll meet John Gregory Dunn up close and personal after these messages. Back now with author and screenwriter John Gregory Dunn. The title here, Monster. Where, where did this title come from? A friend of mine was doing a picture for Disney. And Disney was, was notoriously hands-on. And they were shooting. And the studio wanted some changes made. And the, my friend, the screenwriter, mm -hmm. was saying no, was resisting the changes. And so the studio executive took him out to dinner. And the screenwriter was still resisting the changes. And the studio executive said, I'm going to bring out the monster. And he went under the table, tended to unlock a cage, came up with his hand like this. He said, do you see the monster? Do you see the monster? He said, I hate bringing out the monster, but, but do you see the monster? Well, what do you say when something does this? You think, what's the monster? What's the monster? Uh, yeah, I see the monster. Okay, I hate bringing out the monster. Never want to bring out the monster again. I'm going to put it back in the cage and never want to bring it out again. So he does this. He looked at the screenwriter and he said, did, did you see the monster? And he said, yeah. And the, and the, and the executive said, do you know what the monster is? And the screenwriter said, no. And, then, and the executive said, it's our money. Ah. Oh. Ah. <laughs> and so... So if we tell you to change it, you'll you change, change it. Because it. it is their money. It is always their money. Now, when you uh, and Joan had early meetings with Disney people, with yeah. Jeff Katzenberg and others, yeah. the, the, the original Up Close and Personal was but, based upon a book written by Alana Nash, and it was the life and times of uh, the late Jessica Savage. Late Jessica Savage. So yeah. how did it get from the life of the late Jessica Savage to Robert Wedford and Michelle Pfeiffer and doing the news? Well, the first, I don't quite know how. <laughs> <laughs> but it did. <laughs> but it did. Disney was on a roll. They had 32 or 33 consecutive hits. They were all sort of executive-generated. The guys, the suits would come up with an idea, and then the, 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 the writers, often teams of writers, 
would try and make these pictures that made money. Mm -hmm. which, and the pictures did make money. Uh, most of them weren't very good. If it was good, it was a bonus. And so the first meeting was, uh, I wouldn't go because I didn't think that Disney was ever going to do Jessica Savage with it. You know, she, there was a, she was, she, she uh, had gay love affairs. She, 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 she had interracial love affairs. She had abortions. She was, she was coked up. She had an abusive relationship with this guy who, who was. It's funny you say all this because I worked with her at NBC for five years yeah. and I never saw that yeah. side of Jessica Savage. I, I never saw the side in the other book that was written mm -hmm. about her. But in any event, this, this, yeah. was, this was the perception Disney yeah. had of Jessica. Yeah, and so, so John went to the first meeting, and Jeffrey Kastenberg said, we want, you, we want the audience to come out feeling good about themselves. Didn't seem to mesh with Jessica Savage. Anyway, we fly out to California. We meet with the suits. There must, be, there must have been a dozen suits there, plus Jeffrey Kastenberg, with Ed Hook Stratton and John Foreman, the original producer. And the first thing Jeffy Katzenberg says to us is, does she have to die in the end? And we very carefully say, not if you don't call her Jessica Savage. And with that, everything goes. Every, all, the, all the sort of uh, uh, unsavory aspects of, of her life. And in other words, Jessica Savage ceased to be a factor in the Jessica right. Savage story. It would have been like writing a biography of Charles Lindbergh without mentioning the uh, kidnapping and murder of his son, the trial and execution of sure. Bruno Hauptmann, his flirtations with, with, with fascism in America first. So, so what, 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 what Jessica gave to the movie was a good-looking woman in a newsroom. In a newsroom who could capture the camera who and could, bring an audience who in. Who could capture the camera. What they wanted was a newsroom romance. And so... You know, we we were children. I mean, we'd done this before. I mean, we've been in the movie business for twenty odd years, and you know, we 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 didn't go in starry eyed. So we would we tried to do it, and we had the male love interest killed in the end, and then we get this the first set of notes, and the notes are absolutely wonderful. Notes say, "What is the creative arc? What is the basic motivation?" Basic motivation was great. What, I don't know what is, why not just motivation? motivation yeah. Yeah. Uh, and these were coming from the suits? These were coming from the lesser suits, because the, the major suits. suits, you see, the major suits never take notes. They have these kids who take the notes, and uh -huh. then the kids write, write the notes. The notes are basically gibberish. And uh, you sort of look at these kids, and you want to brain them, because they're all about 20 years old, and they're, and they're, and, and they're innocent of politics, history, art, music, whatever. But they write great notes, right? And they and drive so you do, and they drive you absolutely around the bed. And so, we we got over the course of a year, we got uh, notes after notes after notes after notes. And we wrote in the first year of our country, we wrote eight or nine drafts of the of the picture, and she got nicer and nicer and nicer and nicer. And the guy who was sort of a redneck who uh, 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 was engaged in sort of dwarf crossing contest and all that kind of, kind of nonsense, but it was just sort of a, he got nicer and, and nicer and nicer, and he became essentially her walker. And at the end of the year, we said, this is it. I mean, we, we, yeah, we, you had I, to leave after. We, we had to leave. We, we had to leave. And so we left. And Redford was instrumental in bringing it back. Oh, this was, no, this was, this, this was years later. Then we came back a second time. We quit. And then three, and then three years later, we, we, we came back. And uh, we wrote more drafts. We had, there was a producer named Scott Rudin. who was a really funny man. And at one point, I said to him, Scott, what's this picture about? He said, it's about two movie stars. Now, this was long before Redford and Pfeiffer were, were involved in this. And so uh, then we left because we didn't get along with the director, the man named John Evans. John Evans. Yeah. And the picture was going to fall apart. Evans brought in another writer. Um, uh, he wrote a script that Redford and Michelle Pfeiffer didn't want to do. And so it's come back to us, and we kept on saying no. And every time we said no, the price went up. And we said, no, it's not the money. Not we, the don't, money. We, we just don't, we just we, don't want to do this. We don't want to do this. We don't want to do it. And so finally Redford, who had walked out of two pictures in a row, he'd walked out of, out of American President, and he'd walked out of, 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 uh, of Hot Zone. And he didn't want to walk out of it. He, did, he wanted to keep this together. And so he brokered our getting back together with John Affnett mm -hmm. at his house in Connecticut. Affnett flew up, flew up from Florida where he was scouting locations. We were in New York. We all, we all met there. We met there for five hours. 
in his house. Bedford was in the, the stage. For the first hour, he, he was there for about a half hour, and then he had to go off and do, do some things. And every hour, he would come in for maybe mm -hmm. five minutes or yeah. ten minutes. But he just wanted to get us back on the same page. And at the end of the five hours, we looked at him and said, okay, let's see if we can make this right. work. And what had started off as a really unpleasant working relationship ended up as the closest working relationship we had ever had. I, I, th I think the real story in this book, and I've, I've only got a minute here, but the real story to me is how you and Joan used the money that you made from this project to do all kinds of other things. I mean, you, you, you went out to the Midwest and did a story out there. You, on, a, oh, on a triple murder in uh, Nebraska. In Nebraska. Yeah. Uh, she covered the political conventions in 1992, yeah. 1996, right? right. Uh, 88-92, yeah. yeah. And, and so, I mean, you, you did all kinds of other things yeah. while this was kind of clunking along. Well, this was kind of clunking along. We also wrote uh, six other movie scripts or seven other movie yeah. scripts. And uh, so, we, so we kept on doing it. We wouldn't have done it, quite frankly, if I didn't have to have heart surgery. Uh, and and after the '88 strike, I had we we lost all, all of our projects, and we had to get back on the health plan. At the writers' guild. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and so that's why we did it. It's a great story, and uh, and as I say, it's it's about the making of this movie up close and personal, but also it's the story of how you and Joan used this to finance other projects yeah. that uh, that sure. were enormously. Uh, uh, successful and that you like doing a great deal. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming on, John. I really appreciate your time. The book is doing very, very well. I've read it. I enjoyed it immensely, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. My pleasure. John Gregory Dunn is the guest. The book is called Monster, and, and here's the key subtitle, Living Off the Big Screen. We'll be right back to wrap it up for Wednesday after these messages. Mm -hmm.